So if you're someone that's been having a hard time with recovery from a concussion, I think that I can be useful for you in this video. I spent a lot of my early portion of my career working with people that had not only concussion, but were having pervasive concussion symptoms. There is a ton of variability as far as what someone can expect in regard to the care they're going to get. Depending on where you live, the resources you have, what hospital systems are you, near you, who you know, there just can just be a lot of variance in, in the care you'll get. You might get someone that's from the old school that just suggests let's get some rest and and call it good. You may get people that specialize in helping people with neurocognitive function or in helping people you know get directed toward a vestibular rehab program or toward uh, the neuro ophthalmologist to take care of do some vision therapy or doing neurocognitive assessments or exercise testing, exercise or exertion based treatments. Right, all these things kind of exist in different pockets and depending on kind of where someone focuses, you may get a different experience and that can be really hard. Most of the patients that we see now are people that have kind of failed out of all of those programs and can continue to have that persistent type of symptomatology. I think a thing that can be helpful is number one is understanding when you injure your brain, you have the capacity to injure any part of it. And we actually know there was a study done in, in 2019 that looked at a lot of that injury can converge, especially if you have rotation. You know, you think about someone getting hit playing football or taking an elbow to the face or whatever it looks like you fall and hit your head. Anything that has like a rotational movement is going to have a higher probability of creating injury in the fiber tracks deep, deep in the brain in, in an area called the midbrain that's way back behind your eyes. And the midbrain is really important because it's an integrator of a lot of different functionalities. It helps you integrate the way your eyes move. It integrates the way you control vestibular afferents, meaning the way that the vestibular system is going to contribute to eye movement and contribute to head and neck control. It's also going to affect autonomic outputs, which we'll speak to. It's going to affect the way that we create motor programming, the way we have sensory afferentation come up, it, all these different things, right? But the key part of that is to kind of think about the fact that every concussion may impact these systems differently. So for one person, you know, it might be they're super dizzy. Another person may find that they just can't concentrate and focus. Another may find that their memory is impaired. And another might find that they have orthostatic hypotension or they exercise intolerance or someone could be sensitive to light or sound or you could have all of them. I think a key delineation for a lot of people is being willing to say, what could we look at to back that out and understand like what is the mechanism that underlies or that consolidates these symptoms into something that we can we can look at training, that we can look at improving. And so that may mean combining these different therapeutics in a way that integrates them together, that is dose responsive. That's kind of important, meaning ideally you'd hope not to find yourself in a program where you're doing the same thing as everyone else is doing or everyone is getting the same treatment. That may indicate that the level of specificity may be a little bit lower in that case. Now, we do find that, you know, sometimes you just throw a lot of stuff at the wall and see what sticks, people recover and do well. But generally, if you find yourself in a position where you're watching a video like this, probably someone that has tried a lot of things and has not necessarily found the success that you're at. And I would say the last piece that's very, very important to pay attention to is the fact that when you injure your brain, by design, we have this decoupling of the neural tissue in your brain, right? That's sending signals and the vascular system. We actually decouple them so that we can clear out some of the toxins involved. So some of the inflammatory load is that inflammation comes in, that's a good thing. It's going to try to help heal that tissue. And then it's going to try to get out all the toxins, rebuilding, getting rid of those things at the same time. And in order to do that, we have this decoupling that has to occur, but that affects in a major, major way, the amount of blood flow that goes to the brain and the way that that is parceled out and the way it's controlled. So that cerebral perfusion becomes a big issue. And we find that a lot of people that have cerebral perfusion problems or autonomic problems relative to getting blood flow to their brain have pretty significant difficulties with exercise. Think about it this way. If you have a difficulty with exerting your body in whole, like to be able to create cardiac output, you're on a treadmill, you're on a bike, whatever it is. You can also think about that on a small level. So if I'm having a hard time being able to exercise on a big level, I might also have a hard time exercising a vestibular rehab exercise or a visual rehab, or I may have a hard time being able to deal with what's going on in my neck and doing rehab that's relative to recovering the PT of, of doing neck exercises or manipulations or whatever that 
me and me. So the dose part starts to matter. And one of the things that we know is people that have kind of the slowest recoveries are people that tend to have these autonomic variants where they have a high autonomic burden or the autonomic dysfunction is high. And we see that. I, th I thought I'd share this one paper that I, that I do like. This is by Pertab 2018, Concussion in the Autonomic Nervous System. It's an old paper, holy but a goodie. But if we go through here, we can kind of look at how they kind of make a case for why this cerebral perfusion pressure is, is so important in concussion. And we can see the relationship of other cerebral perfusion problems with the same kinds of symptoms that we get in concussion pick cases where you have chronic pain, stress, depression, anxiety, chronic fatigue, orthopedic injuries, sleep disturbances. And then same, they over, there's a huge overlap as well with cervical spine injuries, which a lot of times in concussion just kind of get overlooked because we're so focused on what's going on in the brain that we forget all that information from the neck comes up and is super, super important to be able to help that. So what these authors basically talk about is how important it is to both measure autonomic activity, to be able to train for autonomic uh, activity, and to be able to recover that as part of a concussion protocol. And there's another paper that I didn't pull up today, but it also talks about the fact that in a high number of cases where they were looking at people that had been successfully returned to play, that even though they were returned, they still had autonomic dysfunction. And that autonomic dysfunction can be problematic because it leads us to having further injuries. And this is something that we see a lot of times in our athletes that play at a high level. So if you're being paid to play or if you're you know you're going to the Olympics or um, or playing for you know for your college team, but there's high stakes, there's an incentive to try to get you back on the ice, on the field, on the court earlier. But we find that those people may be more vulnerable to injury afterwards. And that's part of what we look at in our return to play strategies is decreasing that level of vulnerability so that we don't get you back out there and then another you know simple hit happens and then you're you're back laid up again so i do think that part is very important so just kind of pull that back and summarize it number one making sure that you kind of can have the capacity to expand your scope to be able to find people that can help you that that may have a little bit deeper understanding of how all of these different systems line up and work together right how does the vestibular system impact cognitive function how does that affect visual activity how are all these things tied together in this autonomic bundle that has to fuel them. All these things work together. And if you can find people that can help understand that, then there's a higher probability that they may be able to help you unwind some of those symptoms, understanding the mechanisms underneath them. And if you can do that, you have a much better probability of being able to move forward in a linear way, controlling for all of those variables. So I guess what I'm hoping to say is that if you're someone that's been dealing with that, I know the hope quotient gets pretty low. The more doctors you see, kind of the less hope you have as far as what the next one's going to be able to do for you. But I guess I just want to be encouraging and let you know that there are people out there that are willing to think about it on a deeper level. And if you haven't met one yet, you know, maybe there's an opportunity to find that person, keep working forward uh, and not stay in the purgatory that can be a concussion. Try to get back out there, get on the field, get on the court, back in the classroom, back to work and, and get back to your life. Hopefully that helps. Uh, leave us a comment, drop us an email, send us a note. We'll help however we can. Thanks.